All right, so what I want to talk about now is the banach aleoglu theorem, particularly for separable normed vector spaces, which is usually what you um, uh, are dealing with, um, not always, but usually in applications of analysis. And um, this is a really uh, important topic because um, it really touches on so many different areas of analysis, from harmonic analysis to PDEs, um, you know, to, to operator theory. And um, I'll talk, I'll talk um, particularly uh, on the applications to uh, you know, nonlinear PDE theory and the calculus of variations of this. Um, if, if basically, you know, this is uh, a proof, uh, sorry, this is a, a theorem that you largely invoke uh, to even begin to uh, cook up a solution uh, or to prove that a solution exists to uh, a nonlinear PDE. You often just don't have anything else. Okay, so, um, and this very closely ties into um, reflexive um, Banach spaces. Uh, as we'll see uh, in a moment, which henceforth, you know, the linchpin of that concept being uh, the Han Banach theorem. All right, so uh, let's say uh, X is a normed vector space. So we need a uh, new concept of weak star convergence. Okay. So uh, definition, let's say we have a sequence of bounded linear functionals on X. And let's say we have just some bounded linear functional um, var phi, it's phi, let's say it's really, I guess, a var phi, but let's call, call it phi, phi, um, it's bounded linear functional. So we say uh, that it, uh, phi n converges um, to phi weak star. And usually denote it like this. Put a weak WK for weak star here. Or some people say uh, they put it kind of here. Um, Or some people just say, let phi n converge to phi uh, weak star, or in the weak star topology, um, number of ways to denote this. So we, we say this is true um, if the following is true. Uh, dump in any x. And the point here is that there's no claim of uniformity whatsoever, as long as this sequence of complex numbers converges to this sequence, this, well, it's not a sequence, um, as long as it converges to this complex number for any x, we say phi n converges to phi uh, in weak star. And one of the main uses of, um, this concept is the following extremely important theorem. Uh, and this is called the uh, banach aleoglu theorem. And it says the following. Um, I'm only going to state this for x separable. In general, you do not need x being separable. A proof is much more complicated, and you need to use uh, some, you know, non-trivial point set topology, particularly Tychonoff's theorem. Um, but um, yeah, so when x is separable, we're going to. I'm just going to state it for separable norm vector spaces. But again. Um, you don't really have to, uh, the theorem holds if X is not separable. Uh, so if we have a 
sequence of bounded linear functionals that's norm bounded, um, meaning we're kind of having the obvious meaning that uh, if M is the supremum, uh, I'm sorry, that. So this supremum here is finite. Right. Then I claim that uh, there exists a bounded linear functional X star and subsequence, um, let's call it phi tilde N, but the subsequence of phi N where um, phi n tilde, the subsequence, converges to phi uh, weak star. All right, so it's a compactness uh, type of result. It's like, it's like bolzano weierstrass theorem um, for norm vector spaces, and, you know, it's in some sense. Um, Right, and we'll talk about the consequence of this when X is reflexive. Uh, it turns out you can actually state, um, you know, basically Van Achelaegu theorem for X itself um, with respect to uh, weak convergence, which is, um, I'll talk about that uh, in a little bit, um, but, uh, yeah, and a tiny bit of history. This was proved um, when X is separable by Banach and uh, proven, I think, like 10 years later by Eleoglu, um, Turkish mathematician, um, who uh, proved it um, in the case that X is not separable and using uh, the Tychonov theory. All right, so one of the things I like about this proof, uh, in some sense, the proof is just as important as uh, the, the theorem because it uh, uses what's called a diagonalization process. And you use that in all different areas of analysis. I've recently had to basically use it uh, in PD theory to construct um, or, or a paper I needed used it a uh, diagonalization process to construct the Green's function for a certain elliptic uh, PDE, really an elliptic system of PDEs. Um, but um, but uh, yeah, this is something you do when you prove Montel's theorem, for example. Uh, this is something Professor Bachanu probably did in some of his uh, classes that you might have taken with him. Um, so yeah, the proof is, uh, it's an important proof. And it's also above all constructive. You are, we're literally going to construct the subsequence. And we're literally gonna uh, construct this phi here. We're gonna write down explicitly what this is, right? And for that reason, this is also useful in numerical analysis, uh, just because everything is constructive. Um, you might have a numerical algorithm. This is a way of proving that your numerical algorithm converges to something. Uh, okay, so let's get to it. So assume Xn is dense. We're assuming X is separable. So it has a countable dense subset. Uh, subset. <clears throat> so our first task is to define subsequences, kind of a, a sequence of subsequences. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, we start off with phi n. I don't really feel like writing n equals one to infinity. Uh, everything here is just gonna be from n equals one to infinity. Uh, it's just kind of a pain, but we're gonna um, just define 
yeah, a sequence of subsequences. So define uh, a subsequence of this, this one here. We call it phi one of n. We're going to define a further subsequence of phi one n. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. As follows. So phi 1n is a subsequence of phi n. Phi 2n is a subsequence of n. Um, so uh, yeah, these are kind of like nested collection of subsequences. So what do we do? Um, well, let's go to the next page. Oops. Um, so, um, observe that this here is less than or equal to, obviously, soup phi n norm of x1 X less than or equal to m times the norm of x1. So what does this mean? This trivially means that this is a uh, bounded sequence of complex numbers. So we can pick um, a subsequence uh, just by the bolzano weierstrass theorem for complex numbers. Uh, for lack of anything better to call it, phi mn, whatever it is, it's just a subsequence um, of phi n. Uh, sorry, it's a subsequence uh, of phi n of x1. And again, just to emphasize, these are sequences of complex numbers. That, that's it. I mean, if we're dealing with uh, the real field, then these are see this is a sequence of real numbers. Anyway. Um, yeah, so pick a uh, subsequence such that this limit here exists as a complex number. Right. So that's what I mean by exists. It's just a complex number. Okay, so uh, define um, so define phi one n by just, um, well, yeah, so just define this sequence here, or maybe, uh, you know, set is a better word. I'm going to move this over. So just set by one of n to be this uh, subsequence here. Right. So the idea is that we can just continue this. Right. All right. So I'll do one more and then kind of write uh, how to do this inductively. Okay, um, so notice that I can take this uh, sequence of the subsequence of bound linear functionals, plop in x2. So, the same thing is less than or equal to the, or uh, rather, I want the soup here. It's a soup of the norm of phi n1. Well, that's a subsequence of my original sequence. That's 
uh, norm bounded. So that's less than or equal to m times the norm of x2. So this is simply less than or equal to m times the norm of x2. Um, so again, by uh, the bon uh, by the um, uh, um, uh, Bolzano virus stress theorem, sorry about that, we can pick uh, a further su a subsequence of phi 1n x2. Again, these are just complex numbers. Uh, that pick subsequence phi um, mn one x two subset of phi one where this limit. Uh, again, as a complex number exists, um, by one mn of x two. Okay. Um, so set phi two n to be equal to by one and n. Well, that's a subsequence of phi one n. And that's a subsequence itself of phi uh, n. Okay, okay. so we're defining phi two n to be uh, this uh, sequence here. So basically, and that's like my uh, definition. And yeah, this is a subsequence of phi 1n, which is itself a subsequence of phi n. So we, we have, yeah, phi 2n is a subsequence of phi 1n, and a subsequence of phi n. Okay, so uh, in uh, general, Let's uh, just uh, continue this process and more formally, let's uh, continue on inductively. So let's say we're given uh, phi n uh, subsequence phi one n of phi n, another subsequence phi two, a phi one, uh, et cetera, et cetera, all the way up to let's say phi n. So we constructed big N equals one and two, just a moment ago, satisfying this limit exists as a uh, complex number or a real number, um, depending on if it's the real or complex field, let's just say it's complex number. Um, okay, uh, right, so we just do what we've been doing uh, before. Just um, take this here, phi, uh, sorry, you put the brackets here. Uh, this is a bounded sequence. Uh, the, you know, uh, it's just it's just the soup over all n of uh, these phi big n n's, the, the, the norms of those, that's less than or equal to m uh, times the norm of x n plus one. So it's obviously finite. Um, the uh, Bolzano virus stress theorem says um, we can pick uh, a subsequence 
by n, m, n. Uh, of uh, this one here. That's convergent. And then just set uh, the n plus one subsequence to be exactly this. And then, um, yeah, if we do that, if we set phi n, n plus one, just to be, uh, Really matter brackets or not. Um, yeah, set this to be uh, phi m n. Then, so that means, um, well. Obviously, uh, this is a subsequence. And we get what we want, which is that this limit here exists. Okay, so what are we going to do? We're going to now take uh, the diagonal and I'll draw kind of, uh, uh, make a little drawing in a second. So I claim my subsequence that I want of my original sequence, um, uh, the phi n here is just the jth element of my jth subsequence. Uh, I meant this here, we're going to set to be the jth element of my jth subsequence. So what is going on here? Um, well, uh, we start off with uh, just my original sequence here. Phi one, phi two, phi three. Etc. Uh, so we do n equals one. Take a subsequence. Stick the ones on top to denote that this is kind of my first subsequence. It's one, two, three, four, five. It's a little neater. Uh, and just do n equals two. I'll probably do up to n equals four. So we have uh, phi twos. Then we have the phi threes, the phi fours, etc. Two, three, four, five. Um, this down a bit. So maybe I'll just do n equals three, kind of running out of room here. And each row is a subsequence of the row above it. So yeah, we just take 
the uh, diagonal element. Uh, we'll just keep. Uh, yeah, let's. Five one one, five two two, five three three. So you'll notice uh, that just here, um, and I'll, I'll kind of formally write this out, but. Each phi jj uh, is an element of any row above it somewhere. It's a sub, you know, um, each, each row is a subsequence of the previous row. So, um, right, so what does that tell me? It tells me I have the following. Given n, and j big or equal to uh, n, there exists some kj big or equal to j, where um, psi tilde of j is psi n kj. Uh, why is this? Uh, well, it essentially follows from definition. So remember, we start off with this and we form phi one. And to emphasize that, you know, the these are just sequences of stick n equals one to infinity. Okay, so we keep going till we hit big N. And if j is bigger or equal to n, we just keep going until we hit j, let's say, for example. Okay, so, um, right. So this here is just by definition phi j j. And well, so the jth element of uh, this subsequence right here, because this is a subsequence of this big N, the big N one, by definition of a subsequence, um, each one of the, for each n, phi j n is going to be some element in here. And in particular, phi j j is going to be some element in here. And because it's a subsequence, that element is going to be uh, the, the, the j, the index j is going to be, it's going to be, uh, let me state it like this. This is going to be equal to phi n k for some K and uh, but it's going to be K big or equal to J because we're just it's a subsequence and when we form a subsequence of of this here, um, each uh, element here is going to be an element in here with the index uh, larger. Okay. So this is let's call it KJ because it depends on J. Uh, so it's for some kj bigger or equal to um, j, right? Okay, uh, so um, what does this tell us? Well, this tells us that uh, in particular, for any natural number n, This limit here exists. And this is really the key observation to uh, almost finish up uh, the proof that this limit here this is going to be 
um, phi jj of xn. Let's see if I can squeeze this in here. And this is going to be phi. I will try it. Well, so this here, I'll just erase. This is phi n k j. And k j is big or equal to j, but we know uh, in general, as n goes to infinity, um, we've essentially inductively defined the sequence and we've basically proved that we can keep going. We've proved by induction that we can find this sequence in this way. Uh, but we, we're given, you know, we're, we proved basically that for each uh, natural number n, um, this is going to be true. We, we proved it for um, big N equals one and two. Uh, we assume it's true for big N, then we proved it's true for big N plus one. So, yeah, so this limit exists, and hence, this limit exists, again, because the kj is or, or big or equal to j. Um, this exists. Since kj is big or equal to j, and uh, this limit here. Uh, this limit here exists. Now let's take an x. Let's actually define phi, and we're going to define it in, in kind of the obvious way. For little x in the span um, of this dense subset, define phi of x to be this limit, which I claim exists, and this is not terribly uh, subtle. Um, sorry. <clears throat> right, so uh, define uh, 5x to be this limit here. So uh, a good question is, well, why does uh, this exist? Well, let's just see. So 5x is this limit here. Um, So what is x here? Let's say x uh, is, it's over here. Let's say x is just this uh, linear combination, um, I'll use one to k, uh, of xl, um, alpha l, xl. So let's just uh, say x is this, um, it's here, linear combination. So this is going to be L, L equals one to K alpha L X L. And this limit fairly trivially exists because just use linearity of each one of these. And we can trivially uh, interchange uh, finite sums and limits. So this is going to be alpha L phi uh, JJ XL. And this is going to be um, 
Well, yeah, just um, so we're all on the same page here. Alpha J. And this is just going to be, um, well, we know this exists. And um, right, so um, we're, yeah, so we're defining, so certainly, um, so maybe make a clarity. Okay, so we just proved that this limit exists for anything uh, in this sequence here, this dense subsequence, or this dense subset of big X. Okay, so all of these exist, um, and we're defining it to be phi of XL. So this is just going to be L equals one K alpha, uh, sorry, it should be alpha L sense alpha j this is phi um okay so in particular um right we've proved uh that in fact it's actually also um Linear. In particular, it's linear. We just proved this on the span of uh, the x -end. Okay, um, right, so, um, so one thing to note is that this is also bounded, uh, particularly on the span of, um, well, let's forget about even that, let's just say, um, Let's just look at uh, one of these XNs. We don't really, uh, well, yeah, so maybe. Um, so we know this limit exists. Well, again, this is going to be less than or equal to um, this is just a subsequence of your original, the original phi, phi ends. So um, this is less than or equal to that, that norm bound for these um, bounded linear functionals times the norm of X. So certainly this is a bounded linear functional on the span here. <clears throat> So we need to finally define um, phi on all of big X, but we've done this before. Um, so let Xn go to X if big X, a little X is in big X. So last but not least, define um, phi of x to be this limit here. Right? And I claim this is going to uh, exist. Why does this limit exist? Well, um, really not much to this.
uh, let's say K here. So we proved linearity on a span of the uh, XNs. So um, certainly I can do this here by linearity. And uh, if X is in the span here, then we have this, uh, this is true. So this is less than or equal to M So that implies um, that 5x uh, use maybe uh, maybe I'll use n here where I used j. So So let's use N and M. Right, so this is a uh, Cauchy sequence. It's a Cauchy, so Cauchy sequence of complex numbers so that this limit exists. Okay? We don't need anything, we don't need to know anything about whether X is a Bonnock space or not. This is a, a Cauchy sequence of complex numbers, so the limit uh, exists. Um, <clears throat> you can check very easily. Um, And I'm not going to collect everything here, but you can check very easily that phi um, is well defined. We've done this before. Uh, it's a very easy homework. Um, done it many times before. That doesn't matter what sequence uh, xn I pick converging to x. I mean, it has to be part of that dense uh, subset, but I can pick multiple sequences from that dense subset converging to X, and I'll get the same answer. So this is well-defined. Uh, it's almost by definition and linearity on the span of this dense subs, uh, subset that phi is linear, maybe well-defined big X. Phi is linear on X. And what's uh, not trivial, but not hard, is you know, the most important thing. So I should say, um, well, um, I guess, uh, so yeah, basically by definition, um, because we have this here for everything in the span of Xn, so particularly for stuff in this dense subset, uh, this here is clearly going to be bounded. So it's a bounded linear functional on X. And what's not trivial but not hard at all is that we have convergence and I'll collect this uh, in a future homework. Um, weak star. Okay. All right, so I want to uh, state a uh, theorem whose proof is very similar to the proof of the um, uh, banach glue theorem that we gave. And this is uh, the following. If I have a separable Hilbert space, and I have a sequence um, 
of bounded operators on my separable Hilbert space. That's norm bounded in the usual sense. that the supremum here is uh, finite, then there exists a uh, bounded operator on H and a subsequence A n tilde of a n where um, the following is true. We have convergence uh, in the weak operator topology. And remember what this means for any x, y, and uh, h. By definition, we're saying that the following is true. This uh, inner product here, the sequence of complex numbers is going to be equal to a x y, and it's true for any uh, x y and h. All right? Um, yeah, and this is not true if you replace uh, w o t with strong operator weak operator topology. It's not true if you replace this with strong operator topology or um, just um, you know, operator norm. Uh, you definitely do not necessarily have that. Um, Anyhow, like I said, the proof is uh, very similar to the proof of the banach glue theorem. Uh, and you define uh, A uh, basically using the Reese representation theorem. Um, kind of like how we defined uh, adjoints for um, Hilbert spaces. You know, you use the Reese representation theorem in a somewhat, in a very, well, in a natural way to define the adjoint. Um, and here you would use the fact that um, basically uh, all pairs, or if you have a dense subset, let's say Xn of your Hilbert space, then all pairs of that dense subset, you know, all Xn, Xm, as N and M run through all the integers, that's countable. Uh, you basically combine those two, you know, the, that fact, the, the, the proof of the uh, Aleo Glue's theorem, Banach Aleo Glue, um, and use uh, Reese representation theorem to define A, and you basically have the proof of this. Um, it's too long for a homework, but uh, I'll certainly accept it as a, um, a bonus problem if you have the time to do it. Um, okay, so I want to talk uh, about um reflexive um norm vector spaces really reflexive bonox spaces and double duals this is an extremely useful concept in uh pde theory particularly applying this to Sobolev spaces over an open uh, set of rn um which is the natural home for you know, pde theory so let's say x is a norm vector space and let's say uh, the double dual is defined as the dual of the dual. So by definition, this is just a set of all um, bounded linear uh, phi from not x to my field real or complex numbers, but all uh, phi that's bounded linear on x star. And you give this the, uh, just the usual norm. Just take all inputs, basically take the soup 
a phi of psi here over all input psi with norm uh, one. So we're inputting psi, that's phi, that's all that makes sense, phi of psi. So remember each psi is an x star. So this here has norm uh, one. Okay. So, um, yeah, I'll use the book's notation. So let's say x zero is something in big X. And as I mentioned, uh, x is, maybe I forget if I did or not, x is just a norm vector space. That's all we're assuming. Okay, um, right. So let's say x zero is an x. I can very naturally define an element of the double dual. Define uh, x zero star star and x star star. By x star star of psi. So remember, uh, let's kind of take a step. Uh, Let's kind of unravel what's going on here. This here is in X star, the dual space. Okay. X zero is in, well, it's an X, it's obviously here. So what's natural to do is plug in X into psi, and that's exactly what it is, or X zero rather. So it's psi of x zero. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so uh, a little proposition is that this operation going from x zero to x zero star star is isometric. Let's see why this is true. This, this really is a consequence of Hanbanach theorem, pretty trivial consequence. Um, let's just plop this into the definition. Um, so definition is the supremum over all inputs of norm one. X, uh, well, yeah. Just this is this supremum here, excuse me, um, with all inputs of norm one. Okay, well, let's just use the definition here. This is soup. Psi of X zero That's literally a definition of X zero star star of psi. And by the Hahn-Banach theorem, or really a corollary of the Hahn-Banach theorem, this is going to be equal to the norm of x zero. Um, so we've proven the following little proposition. Uh, if we have this natural map, often it's called J. The book doesn't really give it a name. But I think it's useful to give us a name. I mean, just to have a letter denote it. Uh, I think it's J for James because uh, math mathematician James did a lot of interesting work on this kind of stuff. Um, so if J is defined by just J of X, zero is x zero star star. Well, you can check this is linear. It's really not much of that. Um, sorry, then j. This is a linear isometry. Okay. And we just proved a moment ago that this is an isometry. So that leads to the following definition. A uh, normed vector space is reflexive if um, 
this is in fact surjective. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so one uh, point that I want to make uh, is the following, and that is reflexive um, norm vector spaces have to be Banach spaces. Uh, it's pretty easy to prove. Oops, sorry about that. And uh, yeah, it's worthwhile to prove. So X reflexive implies X is complete. And what's the proof? Uh, just use this J map here, basically. And use the fact that X star star is always complete. Why? Because no matter what, we've proven that if X is a norm vector space, X star is complete. Well, if X star is complete, I mean, we don't care that X star is even complete. Uh, X star is a norm vector space, so X star star is complete. Because X star star is literally just the dual space of the normed vector space X star. Okay. So yeah, let's be a little more uh, rigorous here. So let's say I have a Cauchy sequence and big X. So that means uh, I have a natural Cauchy sequence and a double dual. So J of, um, I mean, I guess it's, um, yeah, I guess you really don't have to use J. Um, So this means that X, uh, this here, is Cauchy uh, because it's norm preserving um, and it's it's linear. And maybe it's easier to use J. Um, so I have a linear isometry J. So uh, if Xn is Cauchy, then J of Xn is also Cauchy. So I haven't used anything reflexive yet. Um, so let's say um, J converges to um, phi in X star star. Now here I'm going to use reflexivity. Okay. So this J here, uh, we're assuming is surjective. That's what it means for X to be reflexive. So let's say J of X equals phi. And being a little redundant here, but this is for some uh, X and big X. Okay. Um, right. So that means, well, I claim XN converges to X, and that's pretty easy. Um, well, you use the fact that it's an isometry. This is going to be J of Xn minus J of X, it's linear. And last but not least, this is going to be equal to J of Xn minus phi and that converges to zero. We assume J Xn converges to phi. So that's, yeah, it's, it's really just, you know, an exercise in a definition of 
being reflexive. All right, so what are some examples of uh, reflexive uh, monox spaces? I'll be leave this one for homework. Um, every Hilbert space H is reflexive. Let me prove that LP is reflexive. And this is actually, if you carefully do this, most textbooks or um, research paper, paper will just be like, well, the dual of LP is LP prime if P is between one and two. The dual of LP prime is LP if P is between, sorry, I said one and two. If P is between one and infinity, the dual of LP is LP prime. The dual of LP prime is LP. Hence, um, it's reflexive. It, that's it's not that's technically you're, you're you know removing a whole lot of uh, detail there. So, and I should say, um, kind of along those lines, intuitively, what we're doing is. Um, we're intuitive, intuitively, this is saying that X equals its double dual. And that's what a lot of books kind of, you know, in some sense, consider um, uh, that's what kind of a lot of books consider uh, reflexive. They'll say, well, X equals X, uh, the, the double dual of X. Um, that's not quite accurate. Um, so in fact, there does exist a, a, a Blanock space that's um, linearly iso uh, that's um, isometrically isomorphic to its double dual, but this map J here is not surjective. So a little little weary of writing this, but some people will say it. Um, So what also uh, is maybe a little more accurate uh, is that this is saying X uh, embeds via this J map into X star star. In particular, um, you know, J of X is an isometric copy of X, a linear isometric copy of X in X star star. So in some sense, X kind of lives in X star star. It's just intuitive. Um, and, you know, some people say that, so just be aware of that. Um, all right. Um, yeah, so for P between 1 and infinity, this is reflexive. And I want to prove this carefully. It's a bit of a pain, but... Um, Okay, so we there's only kind of one way to go about this. We have to start with something, and I don't want to write Rn all the time, so um, pick something in the double dual. All right. So let's say G is an L. P prime. So this, uh, so G, uh, as we've done many times before, induces um, a uh, bounded linear functional on L P. Uh, just to remind you, this is just simply integration. Uh, f of x, g bar of x. Okay, um, right, so I can define a very natural uh, bounded linear functional on LP prime as just simply 
Um, well, this is in the double dual. This is in the dual space. So it's a close cousin of this uh, psi here. And it's just psi of phi of g. So again, um, just to kind of keep sanity here, this is uh, in LP star. This is in LP star star. It's a bounded linear functional on LP star. All right, so this is pretty trivially a bounded linear functional uh, on uh, LP prime. You can check that it's linear. It's just linearity of all operations we're doing. Uh, linearity of composition, because psi is linear and phi g is linear. Um, linear in g, that is. Um, yeah. So, uh, right. Um, yeah. So, uh, right. So, let's check that this is a um, check that this is a, um, well, sorry, uh, it's not quite linear and I have to put, yeah, I have to put a complex conjugate here. So if you put a complex conjugate, that's going to make it linear because now it's linear and it's, it's linear, um, this will be linear in G. Um, minor, minor point. So you can check it's linear. Um, let's check that this is bounded. All right, so by definition, this is psi of phi G bar. This is less than or equal to uh, whatever this is. times this here, but this is of course just equal to, this phi g is itself an isometry. So this is just, uh, you know, this here times the LP prime norm of g. So that implies that this psi here itself is a, uh, bounded linear functional on LP prime. <laughs> All right, so we know that every bounded linear functional on LP prime is given by something in LP. So the point here is that we're, we can willy-nilly go back and forth, uh, you know, P, P prime taking the dual spaces because um, the, the, the conjugate of P prime is P. So um, yeah, so no issue here. We're not dealing with P equals one. Dual of L1 is L infinity. Dual of L infinity is a horrendous mess that we don't really go near. Usually don't have to. Um, unless you're doing some kind of, some specialized functional analysis, you sometimes do, but uh, anyway. So yeah, we know what the dual of um, LP prime is. It's just basically LP in the sense that we can pick an F in LP where psi tilde is given by the bounded linear functional induced by F and this sense here. Um, so I claim that we're basically done. I claim that psi here is given by, well, I can't quite use F. I need the complex conjugate of F. So of course, if, if we're dealing with reals, complex conjugate is meaningless. It's just nothing. You, it, 
but uh, we need complex conjugate if we're dealing with the complex numbers. Um, if, if my field is the complex numbers versus the reals. Okay, so I claim it's F bar star star. F bar is just complex conjugate. So let's unravel this. Um, so let's just pick something in dual space of LP. So this is going to be phi g. There's some g in uh, L p prime. Okay, so yeah, let's just see what this is. So remember, this is in uh, again. Just it's always good sanity check to make sure that things are make sense. This is something in the double dual. So I want to plug in something in the dual. And that dual element is, um, sorry, it should meant phi is in dual of LP. So that. Okay, so this is going to be equal to, um, just phi of f bar. And we know what that is. That's just phi g of f bar. And so this is clearly going to be equal to um, back here. Well, let's just see what phi f. Um, uh, right, so this is going to be, well, they're obviously going to be equal, these two. That's pretty straightforward. G of X bar, F bar, bar of X. Well, the two bars undo each other. So they're going to be equal. Okay, so this is going to be equal to over um, phi g bar of f. All right. Well, what's phi g bar of f? Um, well, sorry about that one second. Um, so yeah, uh, sorry. Phi F is given by psi here, or psi tilde here. So this is psi tilde. Um, sorry. I meant uh, swapping them. Put a, This is F. This is uh, G bar. And phi f is given by psi tilde. So this is, this is a pain in the ass, I have to admit. It's not hard, but uh, it's definitely a pain. Um, G bar. Um, well, remember that, um, uh, one second. Um, yeah, it's it's really easy to uh, kind of yeah. Okay, sorry. Uh, so psi tilde of g bar is combine these two together. Psi phi. Well, if I have a g bar, it's g. So it's psi phi g. Okay, and well, this is just simply, I uh, remember we picked G in such a way that this is uh, phi here. Okay. 
So yeah, we've unraveled that um, basically, um, yeah, we start off with some, um, uh, one second. Yeah, we started off with something in the double dual, psi. And we got this here to be psi of phi. So that implies that my random or my arbitrary elements in the double dual is given by uh, is induced by this f bar here. It's, it's, or in other words, j of f bar is psi. Okay. Yeah, and uh, L1 is not reflexive. Um, I'll probably leave that for homework. Um, kind of makes L1 rather special. Sometimes difficult. Okay. okay um, and one last fact, which I don't think I'll prove. I'll, I don't know. I, I don't have time to prove, I don't think. Um, and maybe I'll give it for homework. Um, see. Uh, and this is that. Um, um, yeah, so if uh, we have, uh, let's say, um, if I have a closed subspace, and X is reflexive, then so is C. And this is actually an extremely useful result. So we'll see in a moment. Okay, um, so what I want to do is finally uh, talk about the main interest in, in reflexive spaces, at least from my perspective and why they're so important. And for that, we need following definition of weak convergence. So it's a more natural, actually, uh, definition than weak star convergence. But uh, as we'll see, it's, it's quite a bit more special than weak uh, star convergence. So here, this is just a normed vector space. So if I have a sequence in a normed vector space and an element x, in my norm vector space, we say um, a lot of different ways to denote this. So we say Xn converges to X weekly, uh, particularly in PDE, you use this notation a lot. Um, with the half arrow, which is a little bit bizarre. I guess it's sort of like half convergence. It's not really convergence. It's weak convergence. Um, but yeah, we say that Xn converges to X weakly, denoted by this or by this, or put the weak kind of to the left, something like this. If um, the following is true, Uh, this is, uh, whoops, don't know why I put absolute values here. For any um, element in the dual space. So first of all, if we have a norm converging, if Xn converges to X in norm, 
then um, it's pretty easy to show that uh, norm convergence implies uh, weak convergence. Maybe not a whole hell of a lot to that. So use linearity. Uh, just, this is bounded. So norm convergence implies weak convergence. So in that sense, it's weaker than norm convergence. All right, so we have the following theorem, which is a very easy consequence of everything we've done. Um, and this is really, really useful in um, PDE and numerical analysis. Uh, uh, any kind of applied math where you, you, you wanna prove Rigor, rigorously, you have a solution, you have your, your, your numerical algorithm converges, um, yeah, whatever. So if I have a reflexive Bonnock space and a norm bounded sequence Xn, then I claim that there exists a subsequence Xn tilde of Xn um, and X and big X, where we have weak convergence. All right, and what's the uh, proof? Proof is actually pretty easy. Um, so, right. So the proof is, let's use Banaka Leoglu uh, theorem, okay? Um, so I won't prove it. Um, So I should say, uh, sorry, I need uh, reflexive and separable. Okay. So yeah, it turns out X separable implies that X star um, is also separable. Uh, maybe I'll leave that for homework. Um, so that implies that the double dual is separable. All right. Okay. Um, right. So, um, uh, so yeah, we're in, uh, um, well, sorry, don't need, I don't know why I did that. Um, so X separable means that X star is separable. So um, I can use the, um, I can use the uh, banach leoglu theorem for X star. All right, um, yeah, so now let's uh, look at X and star star. So uh, in other words, uh, this is J of Xn. So this is a subset of uh, the dual of my uh, separable norm vector space X star. Um, 
And I claim this is norm bounded. There's really not much to that. Just use the fact that J is an isometry. Uh, so this norm here, make sure we're all on the same page. Star. This is less than infinity. So, um, so by not, so by Banach, a layer glue. Put me there. Yeah, there exists um, something in the double dual where um, where we have convergence. Uh, um, Xn star star converges to psi. Maybe I'll write it like this. That's a little confusing uh, because this is weak star in the dual space of X star. Um, okay. Well, this is reflexive. So because uh, X is reflexive, so I can pick, um, I've been, I can pick psi equals J of X. So I meant pick, uh, X um, yeah, pick X and big X where this is true. I remember that's X star star. Okay, so I claim that Xn converges to X uh, weekly. So uh, how do I prove this? Well, let's just simply check. I'll have a lot to this. So this here, by definition, is going to be literally the definition of X and star star. Okay. So yeah, definition of uh, this here. So this is going to be by weak star uh, convergence. Um, I guess I'll do red. Okay. Well, this is going to be uh, psi is given by uh, X star star. So this is um, X star star phi. And again, um, by definition, this is phi of x. That's, that's all there is to it. Right. Okay, um, yeah, so just want to make one last comment. Um, if you're interested in PDE theory, um, so I guess I'll go all the way. Uh, get rid of, I guess I'll get rid of all this stuff here. 
yeah, like I said, um, uh, I forget if it's, I don't know if I'll make it homework or not, but it's a, just a, a general proposition that uh, if X is a norm, uh, a separable norm vector space, then so is uh, the uh, dual. Okay, uh, so it's a fact that W1P, the Sobolev space on zero to one, for one P between one and infinity um, is reflexive. Now we really haven't talked about this, uh, but this is true. Um, this is really what you care about. Uh, you usually use different techniques for ODEs, um, but uh, define the Sobolev space in really the same way I did uh, as a, uh, uh, a completion, then this is going to be um, reflexive. It, it's kind of a closed, uh, it's, it's kind of like the closed subset of LP, um, not quite, it's more like a closed subset of a direct sum of LP. Um, direct sum basically in the same, basically like the same kind of direct sum we talked about in the homework, um, but that's why it's reflexive. Uh, actually, the dual space of the Sobolev space is a, is a gigantic pain in the ass. Uh, it's very difficult to really deal with it. So um, you would not prove it directly. You just use the fact that it's a closed subset of basically LP, really direct sum of LP in itself. Uh, but anyway, this is reflexive. Okay, so that means this banach glue theorem uh, holds for the Sobolev space for P between one and infinity. So this leads us to uh, a very useful PDE existence strategy. Which is often very challenging to implement. It usually takes a lot of work. Uh, in particular, you can see this existence strategy at work if you look at uh, Evans, Lawrence Evans' PDE book. Um, so the strategy is as follows. And this, you know, this works uh, if you want to prove um, you know, a numerical algorithm converges, if you want to prove uh, apply, you know, existence, you know, if you want to prove uh, rather um, the existence of a solution to a calculus of variations problem. So basically you somehow cook up um, a norm bounded Fn is in W1P, Sobolev space for appropriate P two. Um, well, if it's norm bounded, then um, I, you, you, if it's not bounded, you can uh, just use um, this this kind of corollary of the uh, um, uh, banach glue theorem that there exists a weak uh, weakly convergent subsequence. And uh, in the next two next couple of videos, we'll talk about strategies to prove something is norm bounded. Um, and that'll be, we'll, we'll talk about uh, the um, uh, closed graph theorem, open mapping theorem, banach steinhaus things like that, um, very closely related to uh, proving that a sequence is norm bounded. Uh, we'll talk about something called weakly bounded. Um, yeah. Now, it'll turn out weakly bounded implies norm bounded. Uh, but anyway, um, yeah, you pick a 
subsequence fn fn uh, fn tilde of fn and fn one p uh, one p omega where um, fn tilde converges to f weekly. So kind of running out of room here, but I'll put three here. And this is much, 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 you know, easier to state than it is to actually implement this. Um, usually one and two, you know, I mean, one is usually not too bad. Three take you is, you know, really is the work. Three is like really the work. Uh, prove F satisfies your PDE. In the weak sense, in, in kind of the sense that we've talked about differential equations a little bit, uh, solution, weak solutions of differential equations. And often this is just the only place you, you can start. You just you often just have no other way to even come up with a possible candidate to your PDE than to use, uh, you know, a Leoglu's, the banach Leoglu theorem, you know, weak, uh, weak uh, compactness, basically, uh, of your sequence Fn. Your sequence Fn has a weakly convergent subsequence. You just often don't have any other way start off. And again, uh, if you want to see this uh, in action, and this is particularly useful for uh, nonlinear PDE. So this is a strategy probably Professor Bachanu uh, does quite often. Um, so yeah, if you want to check uh, Lawrence Evans, um, particularly um, the chapter on calculus of variations. PDE is the name of the book, Partial Differential Equations by Lawrence Evans. Uh, the chapter, uh, Calculus on uh, Variations, um, it's pretty well into the book, um, but yeah, so you can see this strategy uh, in action, um, but all right, uh, it's a bit long, but uh, definitely wanted to get get this topic out of the way. Particularly you know, if you do PDEs or, or really anything, any anal any analysis whatsoever where you want to leave the realm of Hilbert spaces, you're going to run into this topic. Even in data science, um, this is an extremely useful topic if you want to do anything in data science, theoretical. Um, just dealing with reflexive box spaces is uh, desirable if, if possible. All right, so long, take care, bye-bye.